This is the industry engagement panel. And I have, a, I have an interesting role in that, um, although I've been working very closely with Jeff, George, and Nancy to kind of get us this far, um, I'm also uh, from industry. I'm not an academic, per se. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, I, d I just want to be clear. Um, why are we here? <laughs> I should have really started with this this morning, but, but you know, why are we here? Uh, I know why I'm here, and that's because I throw a lot of sparks out, um, you know, all these crazy ideas, and occasionally they hit a bit of fuel. Um, in this case, the fuel that got hit was, was with, at the SC2 meeting last summer, last July, with Jeff and Nancy and many others working on the Synthetic East project. And um, it, it wasn't the right place to, to kind of propose something like this project, but they were all, the yeast community was seeing success, was already thinking about what organism to do next. And they were wanting to do a multicellular organism. And the thing that was really striking to me was that here was the, really the finest genetic engineering I've seen really in the world on eukaryotes. And, um, and there just weren't many people in the room. And I thought that was a bit of a tragedy. Um, uh, you know, the, the fuel that really got things going was George Church coming on board, Jeff, uh, more conservative, digesting this information coming on board. Uh, <laughs> you're a harder nut to crack, Jeff, you know, just. <laughs> Nancy Kelly, Nancy Kelly has worked extremely hard uh, getting all the organization going. And I had a really hard job after that just because as I saw this, this little core group of, of people coming together to kind of champion and develop this idea to the point where you're here, um, I had to go to my boss and say, uh, I think we need to support this. And, and Autodesk is a public company. Um, my group is the Bio Nano Group. We're developing design and engineering software, but um, but we don't really engage with this type of stuff. And and so it was a really interesting question. I said, you know, one, what do you think of this? Uh, you know, organizing something around human genomes, and just the word human is really the the part that gets everyone going, the most. Um, and I was really surprised because it was the fastest. Uh, it was the fastest conversation I've ever had with, with senior management. It was like, yeah, 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 okay. And, and a gift of $250,000 to help the organizing effort. Uh, that was pretty amazing. Where it goes from here is anyone's guess. But uh, we don't personally work with the physical molecule of DNA very much. Um, design tools to us aren't, you know, can be for anything. Uh, we've got representatives from industry here that we can have a bit of discussion. This is not a wide cross-section of industry. <laughs> uh, I, think, I think that's, you know, we start off with kind of that uh, framework. But um, let's, uh, let's just use it as a starting point for thinking about how industry could be involved. I think we have a pretty good idea how academia gets involved in these types of projects. But what is the role of industry? How should industry be involved in this, if, if at all? Um, so let's, let's just have a round of introductions, starting with Emily. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Emily Lebrus. I'm the uh, CEO and uh, co-founder of uh, Twist Bioscience. Um, uh, me and my two co-founders, Bill Benny and Bill Peck, forever known as The Bills, uh, started Twist three years ago, and we've developed a uh, technology, and now we're commercializing that technology to make uh, uh, DNA from scratch, and we use a um, silicon platform that has 10,000 wells. In each world, we can make 100 oligos, and now we're commercializing those products as uh, oligo pools for uh, CRISPR-Cas um, um, or gene, genome editing experiments. We are making uh, genes, and we're also making libraries for um, antibody development. Very good. Uh, I'm Kevin Munley. I'm the CEO of Gen9. Uh, Gen9 is also a uh, DNA construction company. Uh, we focus on making uh, DNA uh, 
of various lengths at uh, an industrial scale, uh, mega-based quantities for the ultra-high throughput users, the, this would be a project that would be suitable uh, as a prospective customer of ours. We've been around for uh, about five years now and, and we focus on uh, innovation in the whole process from design to the build uh, to the delivery vehicle such that it plugs and plays into the research paradigms. What, so let's just kind of go right to the heart of human, the Human Genome Project, whatever it ends up being called. Um, is, is this something that would, would threaten your business in any way if it was announced scientifically? Uh, or would it be something that would probably be, uh, an, an, like, would you have any reservations if this, if this went public? Uh, from, from our perspective uh, at Gen 9, we think uh, this would be, from a business perspective, uh, a very good thing for the industry to spur on new tools and technologies and new collaborations in the field, uh, things that, that really take and, and makes this a leap innovation. Uh, so I do think it would be great for the industry, uh, again, from a business perspective. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll say it depends. I think on one, on, on one end, uh, we want to make cloning obsolete, and so what we want is uh, we want people to see cloning as a digital experiment where instead of going in the lab, you go on the computer and you type the sequence you want. And so right now we do that for you know, a few KBs at a time and over, over time it, it will grow to tens of KBs and, and hundreds of KBs and megabits and maybe even gigabits at some point. So from that point of view, uh, having a pool from the market is fantastic because it's, uh, it's, uh, it pushes the technology uh, in, 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 uh, in, in that direction. Uh, on the flip side, um, uh, it depends how it's communicated. Uh, definitely, um, we, have, uh, we have investors, and, and at some point, you know, we want to go public. And, uh, and uh, if there is a very strong sentiment against against um, DNA in general, uh, I think that could be that could have a negative uh, uh, impact. However, we are convinced that uh, it's something that's wonderful. The, uh, for the for uh, the human condition, if it's done, um, uh, if, the, if the PR is managed correctly, and uh, and so you know, we are we are very supportive. But uh, it's not without peril. But if we do it correctly, uh, it can be uh, uh, the it is a good thing, and and people will realize that it is a good thing. No, I think that makes a very good point. Um, in terms of your platforms today. Um, like, uh, from the platform that we're working on, again, if we're if we're looking at at, at genomic design, I think Jeff uh, Jeff said you you wrote in-house software. I'm sure you do software development in your own lab, George. Um, who's who wrote your software? Joel, Joel Bader. Joel, you're awesome. Um, you are, <laughs> but like I know that w it's going to be a big step up for designing. Uh, more complex genomes. Um, in terms of your platforms, in fact, it's going to just open whole new doors. How do you see it? How do you see your platforms evolving or changing? Um, and what type of time frame do you think uh, will be necessary? Or is that just going to be driven by kind of the market dynamics? Uh, I guess I'll start. You were looking at me. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, the platforms have to, as Emily mentioned, uh, grow. Right? Because DNA, you can't make them in, in smaller bits. You have to actually make very long DNA if you're going to embark on a, on a whole genome project of, of this magnitude. And so I think technologies need to evolve in order to uh, make those, uh, you know, make those much longer fragment sizes, whether we're talking about 1 KB or 100 KB, uh, megabases, multi-megabases basis uh, in, in terms of the synthetic. And that has to be uh, an imperative as well as the expansion of the sequence space that is synthesizable and verifiable by sequencing. And I think those technologies have to go hand in hand. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely going to, to push things. Uh, we, uh, last November, we announced a, a deal for 100 million bases of DNA that we are shipping to Ginkgo in, in Boston. At the time, it was a record. Uh, but, you know, 100 megabases is not that much uh, in, the, uh, in the context of, uh, of the human genome. And so right now we are making 10,000 genes a month, and end of the, the, the year we'll be at 100,000 genes a month, but 100,000 genes a month, it's, uh, it's only 100 million bases a month. And so there's another few orders of magnitude um, that uh, we, need to, we need to deploy. And uh, so um, 
know, good news is that silicon scales really well that way, mm -hmm. but, uh, but uh, it's all about, as a business person, you have to make sure that uh, the, the offer doesn't get too far ahead of the demand. Uh, so that it's, it's balanced. Um, but at some point, if we need to synthesize maybe a full you know, six gigabase, um, you know, why not? Yeah. But the one thing that we have to keep in mind about projects like this is that even the Human Genome Project started with one, and it took a long time, right? So uh, even though I do believe that if this does happen, it will spur on all sorts of new synthesis uh, projects, um, you know, we don't need to have six gigabase per month, year. Uh, in the first year alone. Uh, and personally, if it just uh, if if it just shortens the iterations between syntheses, it will have a big accelerating effect. Um, do you see this? Do you see this creating uh, more entrepreneurs in the area? Uh, is uh, I, and many of the companies uh, at the beginning of Synbio seem to be application focused. Um, do you see this technology? Uh, really, or people just being attracted to this area of, of genome design, um, really opening up a, 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 a wider industry space? Well, I, I hope so. I think, um, um, you know, even though it would be easier to be the only synthesis company in the world, uh, competition is, is good. And so hopefully it uh, inspires uh, people to, um, to Think differently, and, and if you go back to the human genome sequencing project, um, nobody would have anticipated, you know, 454 Illumina Ion Torrent. Uh, that's just on on the hardware side. It it uh, it inspired just amazing innovation uh, that you could not have anticipated um, before. And if we ask everybody to write on a piece of paper today, I put it in a in a in a time capsule. You know, what do we think would be the big outcome of, of this, um, most likely um, we're going to get it wrong because people tend to uh, overestimate what they can do in the short term and underestimate what they can do in the long term. <laughs> and uh, I think it's probably uh, the case here where we can't even think what the great things that are going to come out. So hopefully it, it inspires a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of startups. Uh, in, in one of my early conversations with, with Jeff, you mentioned that you have the capability to make, to write a million base pairs, but that m most people aren't thinking in those terms yet. Um, and this is, this is, I think, speaks to why a grand challenge can be so, um, so important. Uh, yeah. it, it just sets a whole new scale of, of thinking and dreaming, perhaps. Absolutely, but you've also heard things like Dinko. You heard about a biofoundry today, uh, Simba City and the foundry at Imperial and Edinburgh. So people are designing systems to get ready to scale up the construction efforts to, you know, potentially genome levels or in the case of yeast already for genome levels. So technology is coming along in, in this area. This will spur on even further innovation, further innovation in, in measurement, uh, in the design field, and in the construction field especially, as well as novel chassis, hosts, vectors, transfer systems. Yeah, it seems like there's going to be a lot of, uh, a lot of ancillary development in R&D. Um, I've pretty much run through the questions that I'd prepared. Um, I, I'm going to open it up to the audience. I want to be I want to be very clear though. Um, the the this project you know we've had a, a number of discussions. This project is is really about cell technologies. Um, companies have a lot of limitations. I think academics end up pushing the boundaries uh, in in exploring these types of areas. Um, so let's let's just let's keep it kind of focused on on industry and how we might engage with uh, uh, with this project and academic work. Any questions for or comments relating to engaging with industry over the next decade? How we might go about this, or how we should go about this, or is it necessary? I'll Jake. So this might be a terribly naive question. But uh, whenever I see synthesis, I see synthesis in terms of the gene sequence. But when we're talking about putting things into cells, we're actually talking about uh, chromatin. And the entire, the, the entire world of packaging 
in a eukaryotic organism. Can any synthesis companies out there actually deliver things in that chemically packaged context? So, speaking for Twist, we we know we, we can't uh, at this point, and uh, yeah, you, you need to methylate and and, and package. Uh, I don't know if we have someone from uh, synthetic genomics here, but if someone does it, they, they may be the, the ones doing it. Uh, but yeah, we can't do it uh, at this point. But that's why I was talking in terms of the market pool. Uh, if there's a market pool, then you know we'll put our mind to it and we have the uh, best engineers and scientists and um, if there's a demand, uh, we'll do it. Uh, um, you know, Maybe one of the things we'll develop first is a PCR that keeps the methylation state. I don't know, there's, there's lots of uh, things that can be done. So Jake, in yeast, it's not a radical hypothesis at all. It's it's a proven fact that, and we've known for years that you can take individual genes, uh, segments of chromosomes, and so on, and simply put them on plasmids. And by the time the yeast colony has grown up, it's behaving more or less as the normal gene does. Uh, and yeast, yes, although yeast doesn't have DNA methylation. Uh, it, it has silent chromatin. So um, I, I do think for yeast, it's very clear that all, y all the information you need is in the primary sequence. Now, when we move to mammals, I totally agree with you. We know a lot less, but I think if you start from an embryonic stem cell or a, a, an early stem cell like that, and you assure that the cells go through their normal developmental trajectory, I think the same, again, I don't find it to be a radical hypothesis, and I th think you would agree with me, it all comes together and works as it should. Mark. Thanks, um, and welcome. Thank you guys for uh, uh, doing this panel. Uh, what about the hard parts to synthesize? How, you, how can you talk about roadmap for uh, things that have been traditionally challenging? Um, simple sequence uh, and homopolymer repeats, and uh, at, at least anecdotally, I know that um, the ability to get uh, an arbitrary sequence back uh, from commercial synthesis is is um, not homogeneous. Um, where do we stand, and what's you know what does that look like, and mm -hmm. do you go you know when you're alone in a room, are you scared about that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that that's a great question. Uh, I'll I'll feel the first if you want. Uh, I, I'm happy to uh, to to also uh, let you answer that. But uh, I think it, it's true. There there's some challenges uh, with phosphoramide chemistry. There's some chance. Uh, there's some uh, challenges with sequencing chemistry for verification. And then there's some challenges that things that you can, um, do, you know, perform with phosphoramide chemistry that make it difficult to assemble. And I think uh, the state of the art in the industry uh, is, uh, you know, has a very broad range. The industrialization of that uh, is very, very challenging. And I look at some of the things that, that the yeast group has been able to do in the complex sequences that they have been able to sequence or, or build and verify. Uh, is quite amazing. Uh, the industrialization of that is the challenge. And, and I think that we have ongoing um, initiatives in our, our shop to drop the GC level. Uh, this year we're, we've already come up with uh, something that takes us down to 10% GC. We're going down to 5% GC. Uh, we have things that are going to take us up over 90% GC in terms of that content. Uh, we just released protocols that takes us out to homopolymers of 12 across the board. Uh, but I think there are other things like repeats, elements, and secondary structures that come into play here. And some of these things are not, um, at least in, in our organization, super well defined. And so we are implementing you know, ways to identify you know, these regions uh, that are difficult to make and, and coming up with new um, modules uh, to work around those and be able to uh, provide 100% of the sequence. That is an ultimate goal of ours. And maybe to, maybe, maybe to add to that, um, um, you know, the, the repeat homopolymers, you know, you, I think we'll be able to, to get through, through those. There's some, some chemical and enzyme tricks you can play. Mm -hmm. 
Well, where uh, and I don't, I don't, I'm not scared at night when I'm alone. But uh, the one thing that that's a little bit harder is uh, if you have to go through a cell to get a perfect DNA. Um, what's more intractable is is gene toxicity because you know it's a perfect gene. It looks beautiful. Uh, it sequences perfectly, and then you know the the cell doesn't like it. So then you need a uh, array of cells to go through to find the ones that that's okay. So that's probably the the biology is to me is m more difficult than the uh, the chemistry or, or molecular biology. Biology is always trouble. Jim. Hi, Jim Hollenhorst from Agilent Technologies. Um, one of the great things about uh, HGP 1.0 was the extent to which it drove um, instrumentation and uh, robotic. Uh, manipulation of tedious experiments and so forth, and I see HB2, HBP 2.0 or HBGP right, I guess I'm supposed to say, um, as doing the same thing, uh, but I can't predict what are the instruments, what are the bottlenecks. Clearly synthesis is one area, but I'm interested in what you all think uh, when you prognosticate about the future of robot factories and even business models with cloud factories and so forth. Uh, how you see that uh, evolving? So, well, I can I can make make a guess. Uh, I think um, um, there's a there'll be a point where if you have to go high throughput and and do a lot of uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, DNA, at least from where we stand, going to 20 kb is, is easy. Going to 50 kb, um, it's. Uh, not that that bad, but uh, manipulating just even moving around pieces that are more than, than 50 kbs, um, that that that's where I think there is a lot of opportunity for instrumentation. If you want to do it once, you can do a heroic experiment. But if you need to move thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of you know 50 kb or above pieces of DNA, that's where I, I see there is there is a, a big need for for instrumentation. That. That's my personal view. I agree with that, and I think that we can take some lessons from, you know, again, the yeast 2.0 and, and some of the, the assembly methodologies that were taken from there and some of the uh, robotics and automation that have to be more integrated in with the whole process and that are application specific. And I think that we will start to see more of those protocols and more of those integrated systems come onto the market with projects like this because they have to be tied together, and, and I think that that's a really important point. Hi there, Ruha Benjamin, Princeton University. I was hoping to put this panel in conversation with the one at lunch and the one coming afterwards, thinking about how to sort of pool our expertise in the way that we're doing, but actually try to have bridge some conversations across panels. So I wondered from your perspectives, both as individuals and also from your companies, what are the ethical issues, the social issues that you care about? So if you had to frame the kind of LC discussion, how would you frame it? What do you think we should be talking about as opposed to just getting our cues from those who are sort of trained as bioethicists, let's say? I think one, one of the big challenges in, in, in companies and in organizations and academic institutions is that you really are, have a sub multicultural society in, a, in effect and, and people with different, you know, uh, social, religious, you know, economic, uh, they're coming together under one roof and not everybody shares the same opinion. And so I do agree that having impact statements and, and people having uh, clarity on exactly what we're doing and why we're going to do it is important. Uh, if it's for basic research or if it's for ultimate benefit of humanity, it's another story. But I do think that those two things are very, uh, very important. Uh, because I do think that something like this will have a slightly polarizing effect depending on how it's uh, positioned. Yeah, and maybe to to add to the conversation, you know, you know, we do this, you know, to starting a company. There's really two reasons. One is um, is to you know to create economic value, and the other is to to change the world. And so you know, we are all in it to change the world for the better. And that may sound a little bit uh, arrogant, but uh, it, it, it's what it is. And and uh, um, the the key is to communicate. Um, and it was mentioned earlier, communicate the, the risk uh, uh, benefit. Um, you know, I'm from Europe and people don't want to eat GMOs, but you know, they can't even articulate why, except that they think there is a risk to them and that someone else gets the benefit. But uh, if, they, if they get cancer and they, they offer their drug, 
that's GMO, there is no hesitation. They want to take the drug because you know they take the risk. They may die, but they also get 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 the benefit. And so um, uh, every invention uh, is a con and is a bad <coughs> use and a, and, a, and a good use. You know, with a dynamite you can build tunnels and you can kill people, and with an iPhone you can communicate with loved ones, but terrorists communicate with each other too. And we're not going to ban um, iPhones. So the the key is to uh, communicate all the the uh, the be positive benefit of, of what we are doing um, um, as, as well as, as, um, as uh, the risk. And if, if we do that correctly, I think the, uh, the, the technology can be embraced by the, the vast majority. I think we should be clear that we'll never convince anybody, uh, everybody, sorry. Um, so there'll always be a small vocal minority that uh, we can't uh, bring along to see the, the, the larger vision. So the, the key is to make sure that uh, the, the vast majority sees the, the, the benefit and, and, and supports the, the great work that, that we are doing. Hi, Mike Chow from Harvard. Um, curious, uh, we're now approaching where we would, you know, a $1,000 genome sequence, and if George's numbers were, if I extrapolate from his numbers earlier, I think if I asked you guys to synthesize the human genome today, it would be $100 million, but uh, clearly that's not possible for other technical reasons. Do you guys see the, the cost of, of genome synthesis continuing to drop? And if not, is there a plateau? Like what are the, I guess in the Human Genome Project, one of the things we could have focused on more is technology development instead of um, ramping up ABI sequencers as early as we did. We could have tried to push harder on technology, less on uh, robot automation. And as are th what are the things you guys see as the hurdles and things that we need to solve at a strategic level to do this project if we were to do it today? What, I mean, where, what do we need to do to get there sooner? It's a great question. Um, you know, I'll answer from my perspective, and I think we have slightly, slightly different views on it, but uh, I, I don't think that there's a, a, f you know, a floor limitation in, in the shorter term. Um, I think that you know the cost can come down, and, and with, it, it's the case with our company right now. So much of it is volume related. If volume goes way up, our costs come way down, and we can pass that on, uh, you know, to the consumers and, and, and to all the researchers. I think one of the challenges becomes at what length does that cost come down? We always talk about a cost per base pair, but it's never in the context of a length. If in the context of a hundred mer is very different from a, or very different in the context from a base perfect 10,000 mer. And so I think that that's something that we have to start getting used to talking about because you know, we want to have a context, right? Even a, a thousand dollar genome is not a fully complete genome read too. And, and I do think we want to be talking the same language when we talk about this. But having said that, you know, our goal is to have a technology that scales both down in terms of cost, up in terms of, of volume, as well as length and sequence space to enable, uh, you know, projects like this. And so one of our goals would be to keep the cost coming down, and, and we will keep working very hard to keep doing that and trying to stay ahead of that curve. And, and maybe to add one, com one axis to it, in addition to lens, is a slow time. You know, if you want something delivered in five days, it can't be the same cost that if it delivered in 10 days, 20 days, or if you say, I don't care, give it to me in six months. Um, that, that has very different uh, economics. So lens, time, um, have, a, have a huge impact. But um, um, like in sequencing, you know, as the, the number of, of as the demand uh, for uh, sequencing grew, the, the, the cost went down. And uh, as long as there is more things to write, um, they'll be, you know, we'll be pushing each other, there'll be new newcomers, and at the end of the day, it's all, you're the beneficiaries, um, and, and, and the, uh, the world is, is the beneficiaries, and that's why competition is so great, it's because it makes for a uh, better product, cheaper product, and so it's great for you, and for us, it makes bigger markets, so it's, it's a win-win. It's uh, we're going to wrap up the session a little early. Uh, we'll get back on schedule at 4.15. Um, so maybe one or two more questions if they're, if they're out there. Thanks. Um, w one point I wanted to make is uh, uh, in between my yeast work, uh, I did about 20 years of clinical development, and uh, there's a term benefit, risk, and uncertainty. 
I think what we're talking about here is almost 100% uncertainty. I don't think anybody could say with any certainty that there's a risk. So I think that's something important in terms of the way we discuss these issues. Okay, uh, one more question. Uh, Ken Way from MIT. There is a lot of uncertainty that often triggers or exacerbates both regulatory scrutiny and public concern. If you could pick one area of uncertainty that would make your lives better were it to be mitigated, addressed, what would that area be and who should pay for the research that reduces it? Maybe I can, I can start with for, for us. Uh, the, uh, so we, the biggest area of uncertainty is around uh, screening of the sequences that we get. So we, uh, we screen you know, sequences and the way it works is you, you get a top hit and um, so uh, then you have to search that top, that top hit maybe uh, may a pathogen and you have to look into whether it's, uh, it's a uh, housekeeping gene which you know, is fine or if it's really the, the toxin gene. And uh, so I think the, the way that's done is uh, how it is. And so we'll, we'll do it. But uh, there's probably a better way to do it, which would, do, which would be to create a database of all the actually bad sequences. And then you can you know, screen against those and, uh, and do it in the open. Because right now the database is closed. Uh, the algorithm to, to search are, are closed as well. And I think what the, the um, internet industry has shown is that uh, if you're open, if you, um, you know, other people can stress test you and uh, find bugs that uh, make, make your uh, algorithm and, and your screening better. So uh, I think my wish would be if there was a, a database of all the, uh, the forbidden genes uh, and the uh, algorithms to, that all the synthesis companies are using um, to screen against those, and everybody is open, everybody can look, everybody can, can test, that would be, my, um, that would be my, my, my dream. I think that, yeah, so who should pay for it? Um, uh, we will contribute some of it. Um, um, yeah, I think right now the, the gene synthesis industry kind of self-funds that whole initiative, so, but I do think it's more of a, of a global issue, so uh, but that, that's a wonderful point. Uh, I would also say, Ken, MIT just raised another $5 billion, so, you know, if you want to kick in some from your budget. <laughs> it actually sounds like something that would fit well with blockchain technology as well. Just yeah. kind of. Because that's, that's really a one, uh, if we are trying, so first is, is the right thing to do, make sure we don't do something that, that's dangerous and, and mm -hmm. get some, somebody harmed. Uh, but I think it also goes a long way in uh, assuaging the fears. Of, uh, of the general public. It may not convince the, uh, the small vocal minority, but um, uh, yeah, not an, one, it's a great, great thing to do, and, and two, I think it, it, it helps making people, people less, less worried about, uh, about biology. Because there's this feeling that, you know, a computer, you can unplug it. But people, there's this fear that biology is, is alive and that, that you know, the, the bug is going to take over. And, uh, and so that, that's the irrational fear we have to get, get over. I, uh, in closing, thank you very much for your participation and thoughts today. Uh, I'll, uh, yeah, one last thought. This is, it's a different time now than when the Human Genome Project launched. Um, it, there's a lot more public-private cooperation than, than ever before. I think there's a lot more pre-competitive space. Uh, we understand that these are foundational technologies in many ways that, that industries can be built on. We, the internet has changed a lot of business models and a lot of thinking and made it easier to collaborate than ever before. Um, I hope that we can have a really strong uh, partnership uh, with all uh, different types of organizations as we move forward and explore this and, and, and talk about this. Um, anyway, thank you very much and thank you for your participation. Thank you, Andrew.